Cappadocia, Turkey, an area most widely known for its breathtaking volcanic topography, particularly the fairy chimneys, the result of countless millennia of volcanic eruptions and erosion. Over time, the volcanic ash compresses into a stone called tufa. The lower layer we see here, at its hardest, is about as hard as limestone, around four on the Mohs scale, diamond being 10. The upper layer is called ignimbrite, which is basically called compressed lava. It's almost as hard as granite, at about six to seven on the Mohs scale. Natural faults in the underlying bedrock or the tougher stone itself have caused parts to fall away, allowing weather erosion to gradually shape the landscape we see today. Cappadocia is also famous for the carved rooms, tunnels, towns and even cities which honeycomb the area. Nobody knows who originally carved them, but the area was primarily inhabited by the Hittites from the 18th to the 12th century BC, the Persians from the 6th to the 4th century BC, and the Romans along as on and off by the Assyrians, and the Coptic Christians who hid out in these caves from the Holy Roman Empire. So determining who originally carved them out and who made the subsequent renovations is damn near impossible. For instance, are these renovations Hittite, Christian, Roman, Persian? Other than all these arches, which history tells us must be Byzantine era, this architecture looks Hittite to me, but how would you know? And look at the various states of disrepair of all these dwellings. The area is literally honeycombed, and judging by the state of some of it, it looks like the more modern civilizations that we know of have built on the ruins of an even more ancient civilization. Keep this in mind as we'll be coming back to this concept. Here we can see some possible Roman renovations, Byzantine era maybe, and various states of disrepair. Again, probably built on much more ancient cave dwellings. Just look at the state of that cliff face. How long does this stone take to erode? I'm guessing this is the exposed tuffer or tufa stone here. Seriously, geologists out here, I would like to know. It was common practice to make bricks out of the tuffer stone, which makes a great building material, as you can see. But look at these highly eroded ancient dwellings carved out of the same material. We think of ancient cultures as pretty backward, but I don't think anybody in history would be stupid enough to build rooms exposed to the cliff face. So this indicates the erosion took place a long time after these dwellings were built, and a long time before any of these newer surface additions, some of which we're told date back over 2,000 years. The Servian Wall in Rome dating to around the 4th century BC was built with bricks carved from the same type of rock. It was abandoned in the early 1st millennium, which gives us an idea of how much erosion we can expect to see over a period of around 2,000 years, in a much wetter climate than central Turkey. Speaking of wet, time to go underground. This is a tourist map of the small part of the famous city of Derinkuyu, one of the 40 or so documented underground cities in this area. Feel free to pause this for a few facts about Derinkuyu. What you need to know is this was a fully functioning underground city, capable of housing around 50,000 people, maybe more. If you decide to visit Derinkuyu, you can only visit around 10% and people that have been there say that even that is mind-boggling. The inhabitants had everything they needed to live down there. The city seems to have been fairly sophisticated. There are shafts to keep fresh air flowing and giant stone doors which were basically rolled into place which kept potential invaders out. So check out this shot of the inside of Derinkuyu. 
That is some heavy water erosion, which indicates there must have been water flowing through here at one point. A lot of water. Note that the chisel marks are only visible halfway up the walls. And those smooth organic shapes in the lower part of the wall, definitely water erosion. Judging by the amount of erosion we see here, the ancient carved towns of Cappadocia must be orders of magnitude older than that 2100 year Roman wall. Whoever carved some of these rooms back in the day paid extraordinary attention to detail. Carving flat surfaces into rock with right angles on inward surfaces is not easy, even in relatively soft rock. Or did they actually use plaster still holding up over the millennia? Here we can see some exposed stone masonry with mortar, which looks like it's been plastered over. Some of these areas look like a bomb was dropped. What happened here? Shit's all topsy-turvy up in here, y'all. This looks like the result of a major cataclysm. What kind of force can break solid pieces of granite from the bedrock, hurling them into a position like this, upside down? All of these ruins are attributed to the Inca around 500 years ago. Geologists and stonemasons will tell you this is utterly absurd, but unfortunately, archaeologists must adhere to the chronology that we've been presented with. It seems much more likely that the Inca merely found these ancient ruins, who believed them to be the work of the gods, and repaired them to the best of their ability, which can be seen clearly in the bottom right of this throne-looking thing which is much more likely a piece of some other building or construction which has kind of fallen here by the look of it. Note the smaller blocks used on the bottom level. Not bad, right? The Inca did a damn good job of considering the level of technology they had compared to that of the original builders of the fortress of Oliante Tambo. That stonework at the top is just amazing. See those giant, perfectly carved megalithic blocks scattered around the place like they're the building blocks of some giant? That would take some major force. Now, back to Cappadocia. Just kidding, we're still in South America, Bolivia this time. The stone is rose granite, which is much harder than the tougher stone of the Turkey underground cities. Judging by the amount of erosion on each, is it possible these are about the same age? Peru has numerous examples of ancient architecture and building techniques similar to those used in Cappadocia. There's also a vast network of underground tunnels carved out of the bedrock surrounding Cusco, Peru. They're so large that many explorers have gone in and not come out, which has caused them to be closed by the Peru government, blocked off. Local legend says the network of tunnels covers most of South America.
It's very hard to change people's understanding of the past because we're locked into our own world, our own understanding, our own prejudices really about what the ancestors are capable of. We seem to think that uh, because we're tied to the land that they were, that they didn't have huge abilities to, to move on the ocean, enormous distances. And to understand where they came from, we need to perhaps look at Waitaha. Because the way they voyaged was quite exceptional. Not just in the distances, but the way they went about it. So it's the going about it bit that we really need to focus on. You see, those who went on the Great Walker, those who headed out from Easter Island exploring for 200 years to, to chart the, the ocean currents and the star patterns that they might go somewhere and then get back again and be able to return to that place. They were the water people. They were born to this. The oceans were their life. They were selected as children because of the aura that they carried. They were selected because of the stars they were born under and where the moon was at that time. They were selected because in their young years they found excitement in the ocean, had no fear of it, were drawn to the waves. They were water people, Rapuwai is their name. So when they went on a huge voyage with the great double-hulled walker, and of course if we focus on Easter Island because that's where everyone gathered, that's where they came from, the peoples who came from Africa and Asia and, and the Caucasians who came out of the Mediterranean, those who came from the Americas, they gathered at Easter Island. When they went on the great voyages, they took no food, they took no water. If we saw a painting of one of these vessels heading forth that was done by a European who was reconstructing it, they'd have the waka filled with coconuts, they'd have heaps of food, they'd have dried fish, they'd have everything for the voyage. But that wasn't their way. When they left that shore, they placed their lives totally in the hands of Tongaroa god of the waters. Everything was placed in his hands. They trusted in the ocean. They trusted that they would be able to get water through the rains. They would collect it off the sails into goods. They knew that they could get fish because the ocean was full of fish. And to get the fish, all they had to take with them were live mussels, which they trailed beside the waka. Mussels that were attached to ropes that they had placed in the mussel bed so that the spat would attach to them during that season. And then they were quietly towed from the platform that bound the waka, the two hulls as one. And when they wanted fish, they took a few of these mussels and they smashed them and put them in a little kete and the fish came in and they netted them. Simple as that. And if the water didn't come, well, you took the fish and you cut it, you sliced it in very, very fine slices and you dipped it in the ocean water and you ate it. And you survived. You didn't drink the ocean water. You survived on the juices of the fish and a little of the ocean water. That's how they sailed day by day. Thirteen nights voyaging to get from Easter Island to New Zealand in the voyage of the Rakaihotu. In his song, Thirteen Nights. So that's how they swept across the oceans. 
It's our lack of understanding of how these peoples were so at home in the ocean that, and our, our lack of ability to be like that. I mean, how many European sailors have died, abandoned in life rafts and all that kind of thing, who just, who've even caught fish but died through lack of water because they didn't know how to use it. So these things were, had been handed down through time. They were sea nomads, they were off the ocean, they were born to that. So huge voyages were made by many peoples, but they were ocean peoples. The ocean was not a forbidding barrier. It wasn't an obstacle to be overcome. It was a road to be travelled by everyone of their ilk. They were born to it. And to die in the ocean, to go down with your walker in a huge storm, was the best death of all for those people. They went to the arms of Tongaro. So if we write the history books again, if we write them in a way that truly understands these peoples, we'll allow them their voyaging. We we'll step back from our prejudices and say, hey, they were able to do it. And not just in ancient times. Because I have a little story about someone called Grey Wolf, and Grey Wolf was only perhaps 12 when his grandfather came to him up in the South Alaskan Islands, he was of the Inuit people, and he said, we're going to build a big kayak. We're going to build an ocean-going kayak for you and I. And they took a year or two to build it. It was perfect. And then he said, we're going to make a big voyage. And he was a shaman. He was a man of power understood the mysteries of the weather and of the stars and the voyaging. And they headed off from the South Alaskan Islands and three years later, in 1938, they arrived in the Hokianga in New Zealand. It's been reported in the papers. And then after celebrations there and being embraced by the Maori people, turned around and went home. They knew how to travel the ocean. The grandfather of Grey Wolf, he knew. He did it in the old way, in a little kayak. And they arrived where, where he intended they should arrive. It wasn't by chance they came to the Hokanga in New Zealand. He came to visit the Māori people. So they gathered in the Pacific, these peoples. They made amazing voyages over that huge expanse of ocean. And eventually they came here from so many parts of the planet because they were the great voyagers, the star walkers, the water people. And maybe one day we'll write them into the books in a true way and honour their voyages and this ancient history that still defined its place in the world today. <laughs>